everything that the CCP accuses the West of doing, they are doing themselves. Like that's just- What's like, that called? The iron law of woke projection? I think that's the term going around the internets these days. Are you saying the CCP is extremely woke? Uh, it's Marxist. It's all the same ideology. Well, in the sense of it's, you know, oppressor versus oppressed, the sort of uh, but class struggle. But miraculously, the CCP is never the oppressor. Yeah, no matter how much power and authority it gets. They're definitely the oppressed. Yes. And speaking on behalf of the oppressed. That's why they're a developing country still. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of them totally not being oppressors, Hong Kong, where they're doing a different type of salami slicing, which is a legal <laughs> salami slicing. What kind of, I was going to say, like, people's rights and freedoms salami slicing. Like Yes, but it is, though. Yeah. It is. It is a good point, because, yeah, they have been slowly encroaching. It, it Actually, Hong Kong is a perfect example of this, because they have been slowly encroaching. When they got too much pushback, they would back off a bit. And so this week, or last week now, when this comes last out. Last week, yeah. Uh, Article 23 just got passed. It's this horrible, like, you know, anything can be a national security violation. It basically can go to makes jail things that are illegal in China, also illegal in Hong Kong. Yes. So for example, if some Westerner g gave a donation to a Hong Kong nonprofit or charity that was advocating for democracy, okay, now everyone in there can be accused of- Like accepting hostile foreign like yeah, it's contributions or something. Yeah, yeah, there's actually a term for it, which I'm forgetting right now, but it's like for, foreign- Foreign interference? Mm. And it, it's, it was different from foreign interference. Foreign funding, but so something like that. So so what, what happened, because I remember, I actually remember reading about Article 23 when the legislature tried to pass it in 2003. So 21 years ago. Uh, oh my gosh, that's a long time ago. And like people, people protested. They were so angry. There were half a million people went, took to the streets, which was at yeah. the time the biggest protest right. that Hong Kong had seen. Yeah. And, and so- and, and the party backed off because right. that was a big reaction. And, and the, the party knew also, I think even now, they couldn't just pass it straight up. So they had to actually lay the groundwork for it, which they've been doing for years, is laying the groundwork so that they could pass it without pushback. You have to eliminate the pushback before the pushback happens. Yeah, like, well, that's kind of what was going on way back with the umbrella protest, where it's like, there was this promise that uh, Hong Kongers would eventually get to elect their own uh, like chief, exec chief executive. Directly. Directly. It's like, instead of the way it was set up so that all these special interest groups get to elect the chief executive, many of them con like controlled by China. Yeah. Right. So that so the party was eventually like, okay, you get to vote, but it's only pre-approved candidates that we select. And there was a pushback against that. And so th the party was like, okay, we keep the old system. Nobody but, gets to vote for, but yeah. like you, you will never get to vote for your chief executive. Yeah, yeah. Directly. So it's like yeah. that kind of salami slicing. And then with, you know, the, there was the five. There was a thousand well, there, yeah. protests. And then it come 2019, they, we get like a million people, two million people. We were at the two million people. Right. I mean, protests. that was that was over like this extradition bill that would have yeah. allowed, in certain cases, them to take someone charged with a crime in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China for trial. Which even that, that's salami slicing. Yeah. Yes, because that's the Hong Kong legal system was supposed to be firewalled from the Chinese legal mm -hmm. system. But And I yeah. think the CCP miscalculated. They took too big of a slice at once because what they didn't realize is that a lot of different segments of society would be scared of that. Like it wasn't just powerless dissidents who were scared of that. It was also like a lot of people who did business in Hong Kong were scared because they're like, oh, like all this so-called anti-corruption stuff that Xi Jinping is doing, like what if he comes after, you know, executives in our company? And so yeah, the and, whole society was basically from top to bottom was was scared of this. And I think the CCP freaked out by that reaction, and then which is why they pushed so hard on Hong Kong. And that did not go well for Hong Kong, but I think in the long run, that really screwed the Chinese Communist Party, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. But what ended up happening was like, so the party basically cracked down, so uh, there couldn't really be these large scale protests. Right, the, the, the national security law of 2020. I mean, they were very helped by COVID, right? Because first they could put in place it was for and, health you yeah couldn't like, like you couldn't have more than three people together in public 
in Hong Kong, right. right? So you could immediately eliminate any protests. And you couldn't put up post-it notes anymore because that's also a public health crisis. But, you no, know, I mean, eventually, yes, they got to what you're talking about. Right, that sort of, and they, they, yeah, exactly. So so now, now they've gotten, they stopped the protests. Well, and then which also, is, which is key. they took control of the legislative and the judicial in Hong Kong. They got all of the pro-democracy, not even pro-democracy, no, I mean, um, yeah, democracy, like, like pro-democracy. Like, the legislature had a minority for a long time that was, like, pretty pro-democracy. And, and it was and always... They were able to stop certain bills, Yes, and it was always a minority because, like, it Most, was rigged so yeah. that, like, you couldn't directly... You could only directly elect a certain number of representatives, and the other ones were, again, elected by these special interest groups. Uh, so they were, it was always rigged, but like they managed to have a big enough minority to stop certain things, right. what, like and you're I, saying. And I remember when we went to Hong Kong in, I think it was 2016, and we interviewed some people in the legislature who were like pro-democracy. Oh, yeah. Right, including, uh, I remember uh, Long Hair. Yeah. Um, Poor guy. There was something, something about salami in that interview. About bologna. Oh, I think bologna. he threw he, bologna. He threw bologna. So anyways, he, he was a very funny guy. But also, like, someone like him could never be in the legislature now. I mean, they basically disqualified uh, all the pro-democracy candidates. They arrested a bunch of them for daring to have, like, primary elections, essentially. they The pro-democracy candidates tried to hold, like, a private primary to, like, determine who was going to run in each district so that, you know, they wouldn't be competing against each other. Right. And that was, unfortunately, like the month after the national security law came into effect. So then yeah. the CCP was able to arrest everyone under the national security law. Right. So now there are pretty much no pro-democracy people. Right. And and in terms of national security cases, there's only a, a small handful of judges that are actually handling these. I, I believe the number is like less than half a dozen judges who are actually the ones handling it. So all the CCP has to do is replace a few judges, pressure a few people to retire, put in some new people, and then assign them to the national security stuff. And then that's yeah. Like, there's a special national enough. security court that they set up under yeah. the national security and, law. So and it's harder to defend yourself there because they have restrictions on your legal counsel, and uh, you know they can just they can hold you in detention without bail in a way that they couldn't have done five years ago. It's very much like China. But yeah, so they, they took it's out- interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, I was just thinking about how like they wanted to extradite people to mainland China and Hong Kongers rebelled against that. So they had to back down. Now they're like, we'll bring mainland China's court system to you. Basically. basically. But yeah, so they, they took over the courts, the government. They, they did something with the Hong Kong police because the Hong Kong police we saw when we were there for the umbrella protests in 2014, was not the same kind of police that were there in 2019. They were either trained by the mainland or just directly mainland police. Um, and so now, and then they made it so you can protest. And so when they rolled out with Article 23, passed. Yeah, and this is, it's so, interesting Ami because Celeste. the Article 23 does some of the same things as the national security law does. But now the CCP can use the excuse of like, oh, well, because the national security law was imposed by... China's legislature on Hong Kong. So now the the CCP can be like, well, Hong Kong passed Article 23 all passed by it. themselves. You know, the legislature, you know, like passed it and rubber stamped it. So now this is a Hong Kong law. Like they can kind of well, use that it, to muddy the waters. And it's very popular in Hong Kong because it was a unanimous vote in favor of Article 23. Yes, everybody yeah, wanted it to make Hong Kong more stable. Yes. Just like mainland China. It's 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 amazing how the party will use like these little tricks to make it seem like, you know, there's democracy going on. And it does trick people in the West. Like Deng Xiaoping's whole thing was, uh, he kind of came up with the collective leadership that uh, China had for a long time. Basically after uh, Mao, the core leader, you know, died, Deng Xiaoping uh, rehabilitated all the people he purged. And like, you know, they were all indebted to him. And so he came up with this kind of collective leadership thing. Which is basically, but how, I mean, like Dung was still in charge. Yeah, he yeah. well because everyone was indebted to him for this this whole thing of like you know rehabilitating everybody. So even though he was never the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, he was essentially the paramount leader. 
But like in his whole like reform and opening up to the West, like this was a part of how he tricked the West to be like, yeah, this really is reform. We're not, you know, this There's one no man, strong man, man leader. Yeah. yeah, we have collective leadership. Yeah, it's the party, but we're we're headed to democracy. Give us money. The, the running over students with tanks was a minor speed bump on the road to <laughs> democracy. <laughs> Don't worry, the tanks barely felt it. Oh, God. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, but uh, I think that's a good transition to um, stupid Western investors. But just to go back to the Hong Kong thing, because I, I kind of teased this, uh, even though like the party did this like very aggressive salami slicing in aggressive salami slicing, <laughs> uh, uh. I want a cold cut for lunch. I think ultimately that did backfire for them because number one, Taiwan saw that. Mm -hmm. And like that was the moment where they were like, whoa, there is never going to be a one country, two system solution to uh, Taiwan, uh, yeah. China. And also it was it was a big PR nightmare for the Chinese Communist Party globally because people saw like, hey, you know, the Hong Kongers, they're begging for freedom, begging for America to do something. And it, yeah, and um, I mean, um, the American Congress responded by passing all these laws about, you know, uh, yeah, it's just interesting because when we talked to Hong Kong protesters back in 2019, the summer of 2019 and the fall of 2019, I remember very clearly that many of them kind of knew that it was ultimately going to be a losing battle. Yeah. yeah but they just felt like they were going to go down fighting because you know, maybe like essentially the rest of the world would finally wake up to what the CCP was like instead of enabling all of this. Yeah, and I think that was the beginning to like a lot of, uh, I think that was the beginning of Western investment being like, hmm, maybe. Because Hong Kong was actually a pretty important part of the Western investment into China, that's right. right? Actually, that's another good example of how China did salami slicing with Hong Kong. Uh, initially, that was, especially after Mao's days, like Hong Kong was the the main source of financial investment from the rest of the world. And they used that to build up the rest of China. And then they built up other economic centers like Shenzhen. Or Shanghai. To, or Shanghai to replace the importance of Hong Kong. So it weakened Hong Kong. So that eventually, if they took it over, it wasn't going to be such a big deal anymore. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. It's, it's kind of incredible when you look at like the gradual of all this stuff and you know so it makes us seem crazy because we were you know from 2012 talking about how dangerous this all is and then it takes more than a decade 